Welcome to the James's Coaching Learning Podcast. Um, in this episode, um, we are joined by DJ Williams. Um, so DJ, uh, currently coaching out in the States at the Chicago Blaze. Um, before we get started um, with what we're going to cover this, this episode, um, apologies, uh, my partner in crime, James Peters, can't be with us today. He's got a busy, busy week with his dissertation prep, so... Hopefully he'll be back next week and I know he'll be tuning in. And um, So yes, he'll be back next week. So you've just got myself and, and DJ today. Um, so moving on, DJ, welcome to the pod. Um, do you want to tell, tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, absolutely. And uh, thanks for having me on. Um, just a little bit about myself. I first uh, started out within the strength conditioning realm. Um, did kind of the internships in normal process. Uh, first started at Aurora University, then moved on to Tabal and Northwestern Universities, uh, worked in the private sector, was the head of performance for Parisi Speed School, then spent some time as a sports scientist um, at Fusion Sport, uh, working on just some background stuff for other teams. Uh, then it moved on to me doing consultation for a bit. Uh, main one was the physical prep coach with Pinnacle Swim, and that was with the Olympic and Commonwealth Games uh, swimmers. And then moved into the Chicago Blaze Rugby Club, started as their physical prep and assistant coach there. And then now for the past two years, I've been the director of rugby for them. So yeah, I think first of all, uh, explain how we met. So DJ first reached out to me, was it about a year ago now? Yeah. Well, time flies when we're having fun. So, yeah, DJ <laughs> reached out to me on, on LinkedIn. And I think myself and DJ's sort of professional relationship, relationship, whatever you want to call it, very much epitomizes what's happening in, at, at the moment in the world is coaches from different countries are, are using this lockdown time, this pandemic time to really reach out and, 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 and get in touch and have discussions. So I think DJ... Yeah, DJ reached out to me sort of last November time when I was um, sort of working on my uh, start of my data collection for my thesis. Um, and I was just so amazed by how open DJ was to having discussions and, and you know, through our conversations over the past year, it's been very clear that you've dabbled in a number of different sports, you know, a lot of our conversations cover the sports science aspect, the biomechanics, the, the strength and conditioning. What I'm really interested um, to know, DJ, is why rugby? Obviously, America, you're you know big on your basketball, your swimming, your your um, your baseball, your your American football. What what was it about rugby that drew you to it? Uh, well, it was back in high school because it was my senior year and I got offered a, a football scholarship. And at the time I was in track and field and my body was honestly taking a beating at that point, uh, which I thought it was at the time. And then my buddy just said, hey, do you want to come to a rugby practice? And I kind of just fell in love with it there. Um, just because the coach is kind of taken out of it a little bit more. So you can kind of work on the fly, which naturally now going through like my learning progression stuff, I understand why I was drawn to it. And I played football, did my time there. And after a year I left and then I went straight into men's club with the Chicago Blaze. And it was a time when they were doing really well. Um, they made it to lead eight in nationals. And I just liked not only just like the training, obviously traveling, was something I was used to um, just with my previous sporting background and just more of the community aspect uh, outside of that. And it every uh, step of the way where I've been, I've always tried to work back or put myself in a position where I've acquired knowledge through multiple realms to affect rugby and come back to rugby at some point. And that's what really kind of drew my learning process and everything through all of those years before I even came back because I wanted to create a toolkit that I could be useful in multiple dimensions within any club. So you talk about taking stuff from sort of different realms and, and building up this toolkit. 
what is that from different sports is that different clubs is that different educational routes what sort of realms um are involved in that uh definitely sports and educational realms i would say um because when you're dealing with a multitude of different sports so just between depaul and northwestern university they had around 20 sports and there hasn't been one sport that i haven't worked with uh and with the age ranges too with my time you know being in the private sector i had to work from individuals that were like eight years old all the way up to 54. yeah um so my exposure was a lot greater than you would traditionally get uh just through a traditional track and i think that allows you to adapt to be flexible really fast and dealing with track and field and within swimming, we have a very objective metric, like the time dictates your success. And with both of those systems, you would think that, you know, they're very linear in their approach, but uh, the main person that had an effect on me was Andrew Sheaf, uh, Jimmy Tierney from, from the swimming room, because they first introduced me to these variabilities within their movement and how they would train and it's kind of goes against like traditional thought processes too and those are individuals that are really really good in their realm and they're looking and drawing out from motor learning principles they're understanding the strength and conditioning principles they know their sport in and out and from the ener energetic system standpoint they have to know how to push uh different athletes and know different uh schemes and regimens to implement for the individual athlete and they need to peak specifically in their two main competitions, which would be the kind of their conference or regional competitions. And then for nationals, Olympics, Commonwealth Games, and seeing how they used all these different lines of thought to create a system stood out to me. And I feel like that's how everyone should prepare, regardless of the discipline is you need to look into other fields, you need to look critically, and you need to find the principles in which all of those systems operate in. And then you can start creating a system that you can utilize for yourself and then meet the athletes where they are. Yeah, so I guess by what you're saying, and I think I know all, all the guests that we've had on and uh, speaking to, to coaches out, outside it, I think it's the beauty of coaching is everybody's got their individual sort of pathway there isn't sort of this set linear as, as you put it sort of process of how to become a coach um and i mean from you being involved in you know all of these different sports have you realized how closely connected sport and coaching is i.e if you could coach swimming a lot of those principles cross over to rugby yes absolutely because uh, with the main part of my thought process was creating an environment and being aware of all these different principles allows you to implement the things that are unique for each sport. And the communication styles, they obviously vary differently um, depending on if you're more blocked or randomized within your practice. Yeah. Um, and in America, where every sport is a block practice. Um, yeah. There's very few pockets that are actually utilizing randomized or game sense or whatever terminology you want to put around it. Um, it's basically we need to do A, B, C. And that's why you see uh, the selection process a lot more competitive here in the States, because really it's just trying to find the athlete that fits what you're trying to do within your scheme. And you're just trying to get the repetition so that way they learn it over time. But when you go into more of the open sports or invasion uh, games, there is a high level of decision making and you won't be able to say as an American football, you know, get the play called into you, look at your wristband to take your secondary check and then just execute. Um, they need to have accountability towards themselves. They need to problem solve for themselves and they need to utilize verbal and nonverbal communication to solve the problem, which ultimately is to win the game. So within training, everything 
should be, in my opinion, should be gauged around uh, problem solving and how they can communicate uh, with themselves within their group first and then learn how to provide feedback for the coach, just as coaches are always taught to provide feedback and the instruction to the player. Um, so it's really just taking that thermodynamics approach of, a, of an open system. Things need to permeate the boundaries, and if they don't, then you're going to end up with a glaring weakness somewhere. I mean, I, I want to bring up that point you brought there that, you know, coaches, we expect players to perform or, or execute certain actions, i.e. we need communication more, we need you to be looking around more and solving problems. In, in your experience, have you had it that a coach is expecting something of a player that they're not doing themselves, i.e. you need to be thinking more about what you're doing, but in how direct the coaching approach is, the player doesn't even have that platform to have that decision-making opportunity? Yes, that's absolutely what it is, at least within uh, American sport, because we always encourage players to make decisions, but if they go too far outside the coach's bandwidth of what they think is a good decision, then uh, chaos starts coming into play. And then that's where you're seeing a lot of, especially in American sport, uh, outbursts on sidelines, divisions between teams, um, because it's really the coach's idea of what to play and not necessarily what's the skill set of those players and what do they feel comfortable executing regardless of the environment. And that could be whether it's windy, rainy, snowy. The principles of how you play should never change. It's just you need a, multiple things to utilize to accomplish your team's ultimate goal uh, within the given context. I mean, I know I spent, I was lucky enough to spend, uh, spend two summers working out in the States, working out in San Francisco. And I, what amazed me was how big sport is out there. Like you guys live and breathe it. Um, and particularly the college side of stuff. Mm -hmm. it's funny, I, I've, you know, we, we don't really get exposed to that many American sports over here. NFL, uh, you know, in the UK starting to get more of a, more of a platform, etc. but you need to know where to look f to find it sort of thing. Um, yeah. but I've started watching on Amazon um, the all or nothing series. Um, yeah. I've just started the one with the Michigan, um, university football team and I'm, I've just finished the first episode and I was amazed at that level how direct the coach is i.e. In, in the way he you know delivers information in the way he talks to us about what you're going to do what it came across to me as is what you were saying was the thought process is we're setting up an environment where players can make decisions but the actual reality is I'm putting you in a little box and you have to do what's in that box. Yep. And, and, and it's something for them to fall back into and kind of justify uh, their training. So that's why when you're looking at sport in America, sometimes, and it's good that you brought up that point because that's one of the best coaches within American football. And as soon as you turn it on, it's like, hey, we need to execute ABC and we need to do it no matter what. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm not big on American football, but his history seems to be, wow, the guy's done everything. Um, yep. Another thing I was going to say, and it's a point that, um, you know, is quite prevalent in this topic is the state of rugby in the USA. I mean, you you know, and I'll, I'll stay on the point of this Michigan uh, University documentary. You know, they've got the biggest, I mean, the size of these stadiums out in the States. You just need to pinch yourself and remember, wow, these, this is college. This isn't professional. And I know we've had conversations. Yeah. I mean, we had a conversation a couple of weeks ago when you said there isn't a, a college program out there that isn't worth a billion dollars. And, you know, that's, that's crazy money. And, I mean, will rugby at college level ever get to that sort of pinnacle where you're playing in front of, I think, Michigan – play in front of something like, what, 100 plus thousand fans a week? Yeah, I was actually there when they broke uh, the record. Against, Crazy, uh, mate. Notre Dame. Yeah, it's, it's unbelievable. Like, I, it, I just, it's massive. Yeah, like, will rugby ever 
get there? I believe it can, but it's really how we position the game and its marketability to the regions that are important to grow it. Yeah. So even when we're looking in the MLR now, the Midwest has the largest membership in USA Rugby, but we don't have a team. But right. someone with a very small rugby membership, say up in New England, yeah. right? They're putting in an academy system and everything to grow it like even more, uh, which I believe taking like those small markets where they have a very high sports tradition um, because I think it'll drive it up quicker. But in the key areas where there should be teams, uh, there aren't teams yet. And I'm not sure if it's just because the barrier of entry has risen or just kind of the red tip tape that it gets for some uh, states and cities to qualify as a professional team. But I do think it can get to a level. And we saw it in the Sevens World Cup here. Yeah. You can fill a stadium with rugby. It's just how are you going to do that within your own nation and not be dependent on uh, the international players to drive that. I mean, what what comes across as, to me about Americans is you love to celebrate the success, i.e. a three-pointer, a slam dunk, you know, a, a touchdown, etc. Rugby mm-hmm. games, you can go 20, 30 minutes without seeing a try. You can sometimes go games without seeing a try. And I think that was a, a one of the main conversations that I had when I was out in the States with the camp director at the time. Um, a lad called Jim and he said the thing that has made Sevens a success in America is there's lots of tries there's lots of scoring um, and I don't know if obviously that's 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 one person's opinion does that resonate with in the US is that maybe rugby in its 15s format there isn't enough successful tries being scored etc um, mm-hmm. well I I could definitely see the point that he was making with that because sports sports here are entertainment yeah. and yeah. let's not get it wrong. Like the professional sports are some of the largest business entities in the world here. And, yeah. and you have to respect that with the fan base. Um, but I think this also comes with developing coaches in America and having American coaches start working more and more into the professional realm here specifically, uh, because we don't really ever have our own true playing style. Right. And, and it's really come to how long players have been playing together um, that's had success with USA Rugby here. Because you can look at our seven team, and they weren't necessarily really good from the beginning, but no. they've kept their continuity pretty well within that team for a very long time, for the men and the women. So I think that does contribute to it because sevens could be awesome, fast pace and scoring, but if our team is in the bottom of the pool every time, then yeah. it, it gets a little rough. And especially when it came back to the Olympics, like Ruby got a lot more notoriety uh, from that, but then we also didn't perform at that stage very well either. And that's one of the things that is also looked at in America's sport uh, specifically like now is we have such a large pool of athletes to draw from. So when we're looking at the Olympics, we can't just say the U S is winning medals anymore just because our athlete selection pool is so great. We're going to get medals. Yeah. It's what's the medals per capita. And we're not, we've been trending lower over the years, specifically with the Olympics with that. So I think we're at a period now with an American sport where we either have to adapt or we're going to keep trending backwards because a lot of people forget that until uh, a lot of the NBA players came back uh, for the Olympics after the dream team, um, we weren't winning gold medals in basketball and that's our sport. Yeah. It wasn't until LeBron James and that group kind of came in and reclaimed dominance about who we are like as a nation with our sport that's when it started moving forward again. And now basketball is even bigger here because of that. It's just how can you use that platform to to set effective training, develop coaches, change the mindset within our nation, and perform? And I think that's the ultimate question. And that's why I think 
with coaches and everything developing now, it's it's how broad is your skill set. It's not purely how long have you been coaching rugby, because I'm very big on you know experience doesn't equate to knowledge. Um, just because you've been doing it a long time doesn't mean you've been yeah. doing it effectively for a long time. Of course, yeah. Um, I mean, on that, you know, there's a couple of points I want to talk about with the the USA and rugby. But but before that, you just talk me through this quote. You know, chaos. You you you've said, mm. and I know we've we've had many conversations in the past about how we can make our training more chaotic. Have you always been that chaos coach? for one's a use of a better term, or when did it sort of come to you about this whole, right, we need to be more games, we need to be more, you know, decision-making, et cetera? Mm -hmm. So that kind of goes into uh, just my education when I first started out within the strength conditioning side, yeah. uh, because Westside Barbell, James Smith and Bodie Morris were big uh, to me when I was first developing. And with them, they introduced this conjugate or concurrent uh, sequence of periodization. Yeah. So we're training really, really heavy on one day and having all intensive means on one day. And we're training fast and light on a, a separate day. And right. within track and field and swimming, that's uh, high, low uh, periodization like for them. So training one day at a maximal intensity and really maximal is just anything that's over 80 percent if you're looking at motor uter recruitment specifically for the nervous system and then training below uh kind of that 75 to 70 percent range and that's where we're trying to get better from a technical standpoint because the stress on the system isn't very high yeah. um and it slows movements down so when you start slowing movements down you can start to feel the different positions uh, because feeling the water is the big thing in swimming or yeah. rhythm and track and field. So it's an opportunity where you can experience that. Yeah. Um, and when you slow down a movement, it, the movement starts to become more conscious. So when you start having conscious movement coming in, you can start locking in some of those motor patterns or behaviors. Um, and then when I first started transferring in to being a sport coach in and of itself, uh, in researching and tactical periodization, they use everything that we learned um, from adaptability from the strength and conditioning side. So that's binder choke and the block periodization, uh, concurrent sequencing, Ferkinchakis uh, methods, and then uh, Isarin was in there a little bit, um, but they have a different variation of it. But Vita Fraud, um, he was using our terminology and putting it in a way that you could apply it to sport yeah. and train it in an effective manner. And then it's all based on the playing style that you are selecting. So you see teams like Barcelona um, within their academy system, they're all playing and training in this uh, concurrent system and everything's based off of their playing style. And then when clubs wanna come in, they're going to say, hey, we're looking at guys that can play in between the lines well. Well, if you want to find those guys, you're going to go to Barcelona. And I think it makes your recruitment easier as well to kind of fill in the gaps. And then it also makes your talent identification way more easier when uh, looking at which players you want to push up through your academy system um, because you can look at the data and how closely is it related to the top team. And you can start pushing that individual forward and exposing them briefly um, to the top tier of play. And that can be against a lesser opponent. That could be for uh, sending them out and traveling with the team on a tour for a two-week period just to introduce them to what the top tier of play is like from a training standpoint yeah. and from a game. Yeah, I think, uh, I mean, just from you speaking through obviously your background in different sports and your, your sort of how you've developed to this chaos type coaching, it's very clear that you've had sort of a mix of different um, coaching approaches and sort of found and molded something that works for you and the people that you're coaching. 
Mm. Um, yeah. Which I think that's the big, the big, big challenge for coaches is I think we've got so many labels that we'll, we'll come on to later in the podcast, but you hear so many coaches talk about, I'm a game sense coach or I'm a gradual build up coach or, Oh, I do whole part whole in my session. And, and I kind of feel like coaches have got away from, no, everybody is going to have a different coaching approach. Everybody is. So, you know, there is nothing wrong with you, DJ, saying, well, I use the DJ coaching approach. Me saying I use the James coaching approach. Um, something I, I pointed out earlier on is that the magic of this podcast and these conversations that have been going on in lockdown is you realise how everybody's had their individual and unique pathway to where they are right now and hopefully where they they hope to get to so with looking at that naturally everybody's going to have a different coaching style so nobody's nobody can come out and purely say i'm a game sense coach i'm a whole part whole coach yes you'll use elements of them in your practice but to say that you know i follow x like a religion is uh, to me it's it's just not right i think you, you can't be a purist of it as a coach. And I think that sometimes the challenge is, you know, and I mean, we'll come in on in a minute to talk about my, my experience with different practices, but definitely for you to say that I am X and I don't do Y, I, I, you know, I, I think there's no coach in the world that could purely say that. Um, mm. I just want to bring it back to this whole state of rugby in the USA. And, and obviously you've had the 10 series going on for the last three weeks. Have you been following that um, much? We, obviously we had Russell Earnshaw on a couple of weeks ago talking mm. about it a lot. Have, have you obviously looked at that much? Or? Um, I have, because uh, I watched day one of the competition. Yeah. Um, I think it's interesting in the Midwest, uh, like a team that we tour with uh, for our triangle tour, they actually like to play a lot of 10s uh, right. because they're more of a 15s team and they use it as something to kind of stay fit uh, during the summer. And with 10s, um, I think it's kind of that awkward middle child between the two because you can have a lot of freedom that is gained from the extra space. Yeah. But then you're seeing certain coaches just move it into a ABC approach, like the majority of 15s teams that play within the club level. Um, so you're seeing that and then seeing like Rusty and like his team perform, you can obviously see like his flavor on it. It's, yeah. You can see how it's a little bit more unstructured and you know, they're having really, really big uh, highs and having really big lows. So it's always, and that's the one thing um, that I do see it being good uh, as kind of a late summer addition to transition into 15s, uh, just purely because of the contact levels are going to be similar to 15s. Yeah. Uh, and the running is going to be a little bit higher than it. Um, but set tense tournaments here specifically they're very few and far in between and it's almost seen as like a beer league kind of thing here so i'm not sure how it's gonna gonna really pan out if for the rest of the world yeah if it's gonna have an impact i think that's i know myself and james have had quite a lot of conversations about it and it, it clear clearly is aimed at the american market so you are saying it, it you know let's let's see what happens and see how it pans out um i think you know if it's an opportunity to get more people playing rugby I think it can only be a positive um, and another point I want to bring up obviously you talking about the state of rugby maybe in America not having a worldwide foundation etc obviously you, you know what do you got you guys playing Pacific 2 with Fiji and Tonga etc do you is that your uh, yeah because we're in the Americas or ARC so we have Canada, Argentina, Brazil, um, Uruguay, and there is one more that's in there uh, that I can't remember at the time. But that is uh, the championship that we are in uh, for the North Americans. I mean, I know there's a lot of chat 
going on, obviously, with the Six Nations? Do we oust Italy to bring Georgia in? Do we go back to Five Nations and make it a two-tier sort of promotion, mm-hmm. demotion? And I think the whole point of that was, I know a number of conversations I've had, um, both with other coaches and friends and family, etc. You, I don't know if anybody watched the Wales Scotland game last weekend. You know, from from obviously from watching it, if you're a Welshman or a Scotsman, yet you've got your own teams there, you're watching it. But if you're a, if you're just a rugby fan, that game essentially is a non-entity. You know, nobody's gonna, neither could win the championship, neither could be demoted, etc. And you know, um, unfortunately, at the moment, you you watch an Italy game and you know they're going to get beaten. Um, I mean, the point I want to get on to is if yeah. if Italy were to go down to a, a second tier and, you know, the Six Nations was to become a five, do you think there's a potential there to bring, you know, with Italy come a Georgia, uh, 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 Romania, uh, or, you know, and a Canada and a USA and make that a double tier competition? Because I think the big thing is... It's very clear if something's popular in the States sports wise, you guys just throw cash at it. You just you just need to look at your college system. If something's gonna be successful, the money is or, or that's what comes that's the point of view from an outsider it looks like. So if mm. if rugby is to get a foundation and you know, obviously a two way thing here, you know, money gets injected into the States and then the States inject money into world rugby, etc. Because, um, I mean, I, I don't think it's, you know, rugby's in, in a bit of a state at the moment. Well, you know, obviously with pandemic, et cetera, but we're, we're definitely on the knife edge. Is there mm. a potential if we bring, and this isn't going to be, you know, happen in one or two years, but if the states were to come in to a second tier five nations, you know, um, et cetera, do you think that would be potential there for growth? For me personally, uh, I do, um, because as you said, when the more it gets to a higher perceived stage in the states, yeah, that's when a lot of the the more how what's the easiest way to put this? The more influential yeah. businesses will be likely to support it, because everything here is about the exposure. And if you have the exposure and you have kind of the grassroots numbers that are elevating over time and the club levels, which are really a big driver for uh, the states from my experience, um, they will start coming in droves there and it won't be very difficult to sell a stadium. Uh, When Ireland and the All Blacks were here, the stadium was... Crazy, wasn't it? Yeah. So... You know, there is an opportunity. It's just yeah. what, how can we position ourselves to make sure that we are, we have a good system where we can train players year round yeah. and where it actually becomes a profession for them. And then what individuals are we putting at the key decision-making uh, positions to make yeah. that go through. And we're going to put it on TV. Yeah. And regardless uh, because that's how soccer started getting like more of the exposure here. Once our players started moving into higher level competitions, some start moving into uh, Premier League, uh, exposure is a little bit greater. They get a little pride behind seeing their team competing at the highest level or their yeah. citizens competing at the highest level. And that's what really sets off the movement from the youth standpoint for me, is that you need to have an idol because you can't look at usa rugby right now and be like this this guy like he's my idol like he's the top he he's the path i need to follow um most most uh people within the rugby community can't name the starting 23 that we sent to the world cup anyway so once we start building up this this hero factor yeah yeah to where children can look up to it then it'll start to grow yeah, I mean that's uh, uh, on that point. I would love on a on another episode to potentially bring you back, and when we've got James back as well, I think that's a great discussion that we can take further. And if anybody wants to obviously get in touch with us, you know that that standpoint of 
could we put USA and Canada rugby into a European second tier competition? Would that be viable? That I think that's a great point to discuss because I think you know it's it's not a lie as you said there. You look at the stakes and the money, and as you said, you know with the likes of basketball, it's a worldwide game. You know you. You look at the hero, you know, the top players in, for example, rugby, Borden Barrett, you know, he'll, he'll have, you know, X couple of hundred thousand, maybe a million followers on Instagram. Yet you look mm-hmm. at a Steph Curry or a LeBron James in basketball and there's 72 million people following him. And, and this is the thing, how, how can we develop and grow our sport? Um, so I think that that's for another podcast and James is, uh, James. <laughs> So when yeah. you're back and, you know, DJ, we, we'd love to have you back. Potentially another coach, if we get a fourth or, or a fifth, I think that could be a good four or five-way conversation to have about how we can... Because everybody, you know, let's not lie, it's something that everybody's talking about at the moment, is how can we build our sport? And I, mm-hmm. I, I think a lot of coaches will have one eye or, or fans, whatever, in that, right, where can the USA figure in this growth? Um, but as I say, we'll, we'll, we'll move on with our theme of um, practice design and practice approach. Um, mm. So a little bit about my coaching practice journey. Um, if you want to hear about mine and James's background, please revisit our first um, episode, our first podcast. We talk about our coaching philosophies, et cetera, there. But, you know, for, for the purpose of this pod, just, just really run through my experience and my journey with coaching um when when i first began and i don't know dj if you'll resonate with this i was as a player i was coached under the gradual build-up line. you'd go along you 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 know you'd do five four or five drills and then you get a 50 10 15 minute game at the end of the uh, at the end of training and, and that's yeah. just how that's just how it went for me as as a as a player and then when coming in into the coaching sort of um, realm. That's just how I assumed it went. I, I didn't really think twice about, oh, maybe there's different ways of doing this. Um, and it really wasn't until I probably got into my diploma uh, at college. And obviously, again, and we'll have DJ back to, to chat about this subject, which we really want to cover in future um, pods which is coach education both looking at degree both looking at obviously we've got our UKCC stuff in the UK you know etc but it wasn't really until I got into the academic field with my diploma that I was exposed to whole part whole was the big thing at that time so we're going back six seven years now um god I feel old but yeah going back about six years where sort of whole part whole was exposed to me and you know and there was talk about TGFU and Game Sense, but they weren't really big, big topics back then for, for me anyway. Um, and whole part of whole, when I was exposed to it, it just sort of made so much sense to start with a game. And, and DJ, jump in at any point if you've got a point about this. But when you're mm. seeing players play a game in training, I think for me, it makes our job as coaches so much easier because you can see what's going right and what's going wrong. Um, And I think for me, coming in with that preset plan of we're going to do this drill followed by this drill followed by this drill and then we'll play this game. Oh, hang on a minute. You don't know what your players can do at that. Well, you know what they can do, but on that particular night, you might come in and say, right, we're going to do passing drills. But actually, the passing is perfect and they're tackling the issue. And for me, with whole part whole, with that analogy, it just made so much sense in that I can see on that night what what the strengths are and what the issues are and accommodate my session for that particular picture. And I don't know what you, if you've got any points on that, DJ. Yeah, so going back to just my strength and conditioning background and with like Westside Barber and like their principles. So with them they like to use a lot of variation. So they'll use different uh, bars to kind of change the movement. It will be a squat per se, yeah. right? But then you have kind of your normal barbell and then you'll have, they call it like a safety squat bar where it's just one with the handles that you use. 
you'll have one that kind of wraps around your whole body, which is like a bow bar. Yeah. And they have all these different variations while still emphasizing the key principle of the squat. Yeah. So you're creating and loading all these different pressures through the same movement so that you have these micro variations that if you lose your technique slightly, you've loaded it previously in a similar pattern with a load that is uh, displaced differently. So with that, um, utilizing, they're really utilizing a whole part whole when you're looking at the system. It is constant variation. They will yeah. never do the same max ever movement two weeks in a row. So it looks chaotic from the outside because it's like, oh, you can't learn technical things. But the principle of the squat and the main movement is always the same. They're just yeah. changing slight variations to help build a little bit of uh, robustness so that when they go to the competition, they have a reserve of confidence or strength to make sure that they can still perform that task. And I think that's where utilizing a whole part, a uh, whole approach is beneficial because it looks chaotic because you're just throwing a ball and giving them different constraints. And it's like, oh, it's messy. Like their passing is not technically sound and the coach really doesn't have that much control over it. But as you said, when you're seeing that, oh, their tackling position or height is getting bad, now you isolated the part which is the weakness and in there in the west side barbell system they look at the variation where you're failing they find that weakness from the main movement they train it to build it up so it becomes uh elevated and hopefully move it up to where it's equal to your best strength and then they move back into the pattern of the position from a speed uh point of view later on in the week so when you're looking at that, that is just good coaching and analysis because it's done in real time. It's, yeah, it's and I think again, I know back back to my uh, practice sort of journey, uh, for want of use of a better term. When I'm learning, and I, I I don't know if this is from my dyspraxic background, etc. Is when I'm learning something new, I need to completely surround myself with that entity. So this sort of then moves on with the whole, um, after my first summer in the States, I um, got taken in on an academy uh, coaching role for uh, Highland Rugby Club. I was the head of the junior academy. And um, this was when uh, Ian Chisholm, who was the director of rugby and, and uh, development officer at the time at the club, introduced me to this game sense TGFU approach. And as I said, that... I'd sort of dabbled with that in my diploma and, and, and in my um, sports management degree, but didn't really look at it in any depth. Um, it, it had all been up to that point, um, whole part whole and, and gradual build up. And then Ian sort of turned this sort of 2D coaching picture that I'd originally thought into this sort of 3D living model in that, as you said there, DJ, this, we we need to coach in real time, and and I know we sort of. I, I'll always remember uh, in my diploma being told to write up session plans, and and be you know yeah. I, you'd, you'd be told to write up four page session plans detailing exactly what you were going to do. And looking back on that now, I mean a lot of it would have been for you know, these lecturers are having to mark this stuff. So, you know, I, I get that. It was a lot of it was to do with that. But, you know, that sort of four-page session plan, it's just ridiculous, you know. And Ian sort of introduced with this game sense thing is you'll come in with an idea and a theme and you'll have mm -hmm. certain points that you need to hit. You might have two or three points that you need to hit in the session. But just let the session almost live itself out. Let it breathe. And, and, and we as coaches should have the adaptability in order to essentially do what the session requires us to do uh, based on what the players are doing. And I think, mm -hmm. I think in that year for me particularly, Ian taught me the biggest thing was about adaptability as a coach is that kind of, kind of forget this preconceived idea that, you know, players need to be, you know, you need to hold their hands and sort of walk them through the ideal pass or the ideal way to catch the ball. 
and just let them find their own way and adapt yourself. Um, mm. And I think for me, as I said, my learning approach was very much, I got completely just sort of taken in by this game sense thing and nothing else mattered apart from this game sense thing. And that, again, that was just my, uh, that was just my process of learning, you know, and then mm -hmm. once I'd learned that particular way, right, we can take that step back and be right. Okay. Game sense is this, but there are times where you're going to need gradual build up, you know, etc. cetera. Um, and I know particularly um, where I'm at now, or, you know, I've, with the pandemic, I've not coached since February. Uh, and even mm. then, that uh, two months I spent with Quinn, Harlequins and, and Gary Street, it was very much mentorship and learning. So I wouldn't say I was out and out coaching. I was almost shadowing Gary and, and you know, uh, following what he did, etc. So I, I wouldn't say I, I've not had a, a, a full-time head coaching role since last summer when I was doing... Bedford University and even then I, I look back at Bedford University and I think the practice that I was doing there was very much game sense and I look back and hindsight's a wonderful wonderful thing and I mean I, I was the third year student at the time I was doing a top-up degree I had a, I had a dissertation to do um, a lot of the pain that James is going through right now bless him yeah um, I couldn't put the time in that I would have wanted to put into that program which I think I stayed with the safe approach of, I know game sense, I'm just going to do game sense. I look back now and I think if I'd had more time, I should have done more block practice. I could have done more gradual build-up. I could have done more um, and sort of not be scared just to stick with one label, but sort of mm -hmm. bring a number of different labels in. So this is me after... You know, this is, well, I guess this ninth year doesn't really count because we haven't really coached, but my ninth year of coach learning, shall we say, I'm only really figure, figuring out now that actually you don't need to stick with these labels. Let's, let's combine what suits you as a coach. And I think that's really, really important is we need to know our strengths and we need to know what we need to work on, but also make, make a coaching practice suit the environment that you're in. And the point I bring up on this slide is it's important to understand yeah. for one group of players, what might work might not work for another group. But even more than that, if we look at in depth, what might work one week for one group isn't going to work another week for, for the same group. And I know it's something, again, that we'll be yeah. picking up uh, in later slides. I start a new coaching uh, role in January, which I won't give too much detail about right now, but a lot of conversation with the director of rugby and, and other coaches is how we can come up with almost a Cambridge, well, I've said it there, uh, uh, an approach to suit the club that we're going in and not feel so constrained almost by the different um, labels that have been given. Um, yeah. Again, DJ, shoot him whenever you want, man. Yeah, I think you brought up a really good point there. Um, because as coaches, we all think, even though we plan and project everything for it uh, to be linear in nature, and obviously if the training is well suited, it will trend that way over time. But specifically when it's going to players' response to stimulus, just as you stated, even though it may work one week and is very successful for them, all right, against whether it be the opponent or the specific tasks that you're giving them in training. The stabilization points for those are going to be very wide in variation because everyone adapts at a different rate because you're not going to step in the same river twice. Exactly. And the biggest thing that even brought uh, me to that point was – when you were talking about utilizing uh, the game sense approach and when you were all in, uh, you said the individual said, you have to let the session breathe, right? And from my point of view, I think that's a very big thing that coaches need to understand is that the practice session will not breathe, self-organize or become adaptable if you keep talking. 
because all you're doing is sucking the air out of the session. Exactly. Exactly. And think- you have to be okay with letting things become messy because that's where you're going to find where the issue is. If you want everything to be too perfect, as soon as it's put under stress in a match, and as much as we want to yell from the sidelines or try and send in <laughs> messages, we're going to be either not heard, all right, until halftime or the end of the game, or that message that you're sending in uh, with the water boy or whatever after a score, you don't even know if that team's changing what they want to do because they have a trigger that they've been taught in practice that, oh, now we're up 12. Like, we're going to be conservative. So now you just made an adjustment because they're being aggressive and now you're just playing into their hands. You never want to be reactionary, right? You want to expose them to all these different components yeah. and let them solve and work through those stressors in training at a rate twice as much as they'll see it in a game because they can come to recognize those situations quicker. Yeah, I think you're right. And I think a lot of it is to do it. I mean, you and me, you know, we can sit here, you know, we've been in coaching for a, a decent amount of time. I, I, you know, I see myself never stop learning personally. I, I don't know about you, DJ, but I think that's the joy of coaching is you never stop learning, but you've got to be open to that. And I think a lot of a lot of people view coaching as this com- complicated thing, and sometimes they overcomplicate it. And yeah, yeah, coaching is coaching is complicated. But you need to, if you're willing to learn and expose yourself to these different um, types of practice, these different environments. If you if you go all in and learn about these things, but then also, and I think again, this is probably something I've only been able to sort of bring into my practice this last year from having conversations like this is yes you've got to go in and learn everything about it and 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 completely you know involve yourself in the practice but then you've got to step back and view ah right actually there might be a better way than what i thought originally Mm -hmm. um and i know it's something that if last week's pod we had grant dury on and yeah. he brought up the perfect point at the end. I think we went through 45 minutes and didn't talk about a rugby ball once. It was all about coming into new environments, making connections, building trust, and, and making and, and allowing culture to just develop. Um, and I think if you get that right, I, I think you don't even need to think about the practice you're going to use because you already know what suits that group. Um, yeah. And again, I, I think, and I myself have done this, I've jumped the gun with a number of new groups where I've come in and sort of, oh, I'm game sense coach, this is what we're going to do. And I think there was an almost a, a naivety with me with the university um, program in that I came in with this game sense approach, right, we're going to do this. And on the whole, the, the boys did respond to it. They, they enjoyed it, etc. But because they enjoyed it, they, you know, the feedback was good. I didn't then step back and think, ah, is there a different way of doing this potentially? I just thought, it was, oh, brilliant, excellent. We're just going to be a game sense uh, team. Mm-hmm. And I know the feedback I got at the end of the season from the captain and from, from a number of senior players was, we would have liked to have had more time to do technical practice. And again, Looking back on that, I should have been able to step back from my game sense label a lot, lot sooner. Um, and I, I, I honestly think that that is the best. That's the best feedback I could have ever had at the end of that season. Was it was good, but we would have liked something else. Was right, okay. I need to step back sooner. I need, I need to have this whole sort of whole view of not just individual labels, but right mm-hmm. okay forget about these labels forget about game sense etc whatever you know all about this stuff because you've you've learned it and you continue to learn what suits the team that i'm with uh, yeah, and i would even go uh, a little bit further in being a bit more even critical like from that experience um and even asking yourself yes they said they came to me after the season, they would like more time for technical execution. Well, what 
what did I create within that uh, environment or system? And why do they feel they had to tell me at such a later date when they could have interjected earlier? Exactly, exactly. And I think, again, it's, I think the strong, one of the strongest skills a coach can have is the ability to be silent. And I think that's something that I've definitely tried to incorporate into my sideline approach is that on game day, I get the guys warmed up. I allow them to do 15, 20 minutes of just pure individual stuff, whether that be listening to music, chatting with one another, you know, relaxing, stretching, whatever. Um, and then I'll give a few messages at the start of, of, of the day and then once they're warmed up it's all them and, and even on the pitch it's all them I, I, I think coaches are too too busy as you said screaming from the sideline when they're not listening to you they can't hear what you're saying so you're just wasting energy and oh yeah and I've done it myself multiple times so I can't even <laughs> Everyone has, every coach has, you know, I think if you haven't done that, you're lying. Uh, every coach has, you know, you might not be doing it anymore, but at one point you have had that from the sideline. And I think what I realized through being silent, you see a heck of a lot more, which means come half time when the guys are knackered, they want water. They just want that 10 minutes just to recover and get ready for second half. They'd much rather be listening to a captain or whatever. If you've been yes. screaming from the touchline, you'll come in with loads of absolute rubbish in the circle. They're not going to take anything in. They're not going to have time to mentally or physically recover, and they're going to go out, and they're not going to do any better. Whereas if you come in with a few key points, guys, we need more communication. We need to come up faster on defense. You know, I, I usually like to come in with one psychological point i.e whether that be we need to be more focused on you know communication we need to be looking at our um our spacing etc i'll come in with one attack point so we need to be deeper on attack um we need to have our pods set up earlier etc and then one point on defense and that's me so there's three points there i'll come in which some might argue that's too many which fair enough let's have a chat about it and then i'll walk away and mm -hmm. I think I know when I've when I've followed that approach, my players have a clearer mind because all they're worried about is what they need to do out on the pitch, and they're not worried about oh James is going to be in my ear, he's going to be constantly shouting about me, blah 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 blah. They can just focus on the game and focus on their performance. Um, and how how do you feel? Uh, that works if you have like assistant staff and um, maybe even trainer trying to work in within that halftime setup. So, with with the degree with the uh, university role, I was the only coach, mm -hmm. which had its. Looking back on it now, I wished I had had a couple of coaches with me because I think that pushback from game sense and being able to be more aware of my practice would have come a lot sooner. But I, I think that when I've been in a, in a role where there's been three or four other coaches, I've been that assistant coach and it's, it's been your volunteer dads who have the best intentions and they just want the best for the guys, the best for, you know, their son, the best for the lads. They've not got a bad, bad intention at all but they're just talking absolute rubbish from the touchline. They're just screaming, shouting, you know, coming into a halftime huddle. And they're just absolutely talking crap that boys just can't sort of get into their head. And I know I had a conversation uh, with Ian at one point in that... but. The, the boys just are not listening to this coach. I won't say a name because that's not fair. Because what he's talking is absolute rubbish. Mm -hmm. And the guys just aren't paying attention to it. Um, and I mean, we've all been there. We've all spoken rubbish. You know, every coach at one point has blown their gun. They've gone absolutely mental, a group of lads. 
and you probably don't even know what you're saying. We've all done it. And I find with assistant staff, what I try and, or myself and Ian had a chat about, um, it was the under 16s team that I was helping with at the time. There was myself and four other coaches. And I, I said, right, there needs to be one coach at half time giving instruction. Do not, oh, yeah, absolutely, three or four on the touchline, have a chat, collaborate. But at, at half time, whether it be assistant, head, whatever, there needs to be one coach going in. And every other coach there is just to give. Uh, to build up that motivational sort of battery again, but yeah. actual actual feedback, one coach is doing it because on game day, players they've got one focus and that's the game. They do not care what you're going to say. They want motivation, and if you are going to say something, it needs to be clear, it needs to be concise, and it needs to be from one person. Um, so we we had a big chat about that. In that one one coach does the warm up. One coach does uh, the team talk at the start, but then keep it short, keep it concise, and then let the boys just do their own thing. Because at yeah. the end of the day, I think what coaches forget is that the players are the ones that are playing the game, not us. And, and exactly. almost, almost on game day, our job is to fill that, that, that motivational battery and just get them, get them in a good headspace. You know, you are you, in twenty minutes of a warm up. You are not gonna get them a better passer. You're not gonna get them a better tackler. I know this is the thing I have with warm ups. You'll see, uh, they'll be doing line out practice, and a coach, if if the hooker isn't hitting the line out jumper, they'll keep going and going and going. And by the end, you've done ten minutes of warm up just doing line out. I've got a thing of. We're going to do five line-outs and whatever happens, we then move on because you can't change that. And it's this whole thing of, oh, if we keep doing it, it's going to get better. Not on game day, it won't because they've got the players are nervous. They're, they're overthinking things. Let's do five line-outs. If it works, brilliant. If it doesn't, right, let's do it. We're fine. Mm -hmm. Move on. Let's go. Um, and I don't know are what you... your, your view on that is. Yeah. So with me, especially as time has gone along, uh, I'll just tell the captain for our team, like they're now in charge of warm up. They know what drills we should be doing. Um, they're in control of that. And then if we're talking about from a match day perspective, the only thing I'll be really probably hard on them is like our Argentina defense drill. Um, because that's where my voice is being communicated a lot. Then once that breaks off, all I'm doing is letting them kind of self-organize. Uh, line up will go with like their forwards coach, backs will split off with uh, the backs coach. And then they'll have their little five minute segment, just have a small discussion. Then we have landmarks that we think are important for that match for the team that we're playing. So all I'll do is just say line out 22 attack in and they'll set up, they'll run through uh, and we'll keep it for a time or a duration, like no more than 60 seconds um, for that one implement or that one position. And then we'll flip uh, right away to a new area. So say we'll do uh, attacking scrum from 10 meter in and let them go for 60 seconds, just putting them in different spots on the field and let them self-organize and emphasize the intent that we taught them in practice. It's like, all right, we're uh, in their zone three. All right, what's the principles that we like to play in zone three, all right? And that's moving hard and fast through the center to keep the space wide. So they'll emphasize and showcase that um, and they have 60 seconds to do it. And they move on to the next thing. So it's just letting them sort through themselves on game day. Yeah. And then for me, I'll either just be completely watching just uh, from the back in the end zone, or I'll actually move into the line and I'll just uh, mess around with them a little bit, make sure they're laughing, make yeah. sure they're having yeah. a good time through it. Yeah. Not, not coaching them no. during that whole process. And it was an interesting point that you did bring up. Um, 
when you were talking about like your own huddles and this was something that I did pick up from Rusty like quite a while ago is how they are communicating when the ball play stops. So with our practice, I will communicate through the captains yeah. only. So it's their job to disseminate the rules or constraints of the game and the scoring system of the game to their teammates. I'll let them play through a period of time, depending on, obviously there's different things because we have a lot of layers into it. Yeah. Um, but for that time frame or the energy system component that we're training for that, uh, we'll split it off into two halves, just like a match. Yeah. I'll let them run through that time. And then I'll bring captains in toward the center again. I'll give them each like a uh, talking piece or a weakness. And if they solve that problem, they'll get an additional bonus point if I feel they were able to do that. And it's always ending with a score as well. So if they have a problem or a weakness, it needs to be fixed to contribute to a scoring outcome. Um, because it sets parameters for them in a learning that because it's an invasion came, we have to keep them out of our territory and we have to score more points than they do. That's that's the only way you win. So you always anchor some of those weaknesses and rewarding it with additional point or an additional point or a scoring system structure that is beneficial for them to get the point that you're trying to get across to them. Yeah. And I, I think that's a really, really important um, point you made there is that it has to come through the players. You know, you, you can give points, et cetera, but I think it's a lot stronger if it comes through the players. I know, I know there's something that I've used um, previously with some, um, with some groups of players is that actually let them deliver parts of sessions. And it's, it's certainly something that um, we're heavily talking about with this new role that I'll be, I'll be taking up in January is, you know, have players deliver parts of practice. Because again, I think as, co as coaching practice, we've got to have that one point in mind in that at the end of the day, the players are the ones that are playing the game, not us. Um, and it's a point that, you know, I've I've always sort of viewed coaching as a as a picture, and that your yeah. role as the coach is your that picture frame, um, and within that picture frame, the players are the ones that are creating the picture, that blank canvas. The players are the ones that are creating that that painting, that drawing, whatever you want to call it. There are times when you're going to have to be that tracing paper where you're going to have to give more guidance or, or sometimes direct instruction to players that are maybe struggling or, or, or are asking for it. You know, some players will ask for direct instruction. It's, it's dependent on how they prefer to learn. Um, but yeah, I've, yeah. I've always had that picture approaching that we are the picture frame. The, the, the players at the end of the day are the ones that are creating the picture and they're creating the magic. And, and one, one point you really brought up there was it's about players having fun. You got to make sure that they're happy in that environment. You know, we we can have the best intentions in the world as coaches, but if our players aren't enjoying the environment and they aren't having fun, mm -hmm. our coaching practice in essence becomes immaterial. Um, oh, most definitely. And even from a psychological uh perspective as well for their development how they see themselves within the team yeah because we always want to talk about especially from academic side right when group performance is vital or your outcome in which you're judged on right yeah. each individual needs to have a framework in which we know as a team we want to operate yeah. And it's putting them in the best position, all right, to learn, to make sure they're contributing to that success. And if they feel that they're not doing or their voice isn't heard, all they're going to do is just pull themselves out of the practice or they'll purposefully go against the principle. And we also need to be okay with coaches at knowing that we have to step in yeah. or – or give a negative consequence for something if 
the team itself is letting that individual keep going. Because if you want to talk about accountability and making them uh, self-aware, making decisions that are beneficial for them to solve their ultimate goal, they also have to be the ones to reach into their own group and say, hey, like, you're kind of getting too far outside of our principles here. Like, and what we want to accomplish is almost becoming negative, right? Those individuals need to have that discussion first, but the players, no matter where the situation from the youth all the way up to the professional, they're so dependent on the coach to do that. How would you, in your circumstance, and thinking of the role that you're going into now, um, build that into your team? Because if we want them to be self-reliant uh, to achieve a goal, we, we also should give them skills, right, to make sure if there's negative consequences coming, that they're accountable and they need to fix that issue themselves. Absolutely, and that's that's really interesting. I um, actually had a conversation this this past week, uh, Friday, with the DOR of, of the club that I'm going in with, um, and we spoke a lot about for me coming in as a as a director of a program and and leading you know this new women's team that we want to develop and, and a new performance pathway for for the girls and, and, and the women at the club is I can have the best ideas in the world, but unless I know and understand what's currently there, I can't bring in um, my my thoughts. And I, I, I'm a big I'm a big believer in that you've got to understand, you've got to build an understanding and build a level of trust within a new environment before you can look to change and adapt that environment. So, so in answer to that question, I think the biggest thing you can do to begin with is build that understanding. You are there as the observer. You're there to look, to, to analyze. You're there to also talk to these, you know, these new players. I, I'm aware that probably my first three, four weeks in this role is just going to be communicating, talking, you know, build a build that build those professional relationships up. And mm. I think from that, hopefully, trust will build, and hopefully, a cult culture. You know this, DJ. You know, you we've we've been in culture for a long time. Culture just doesn't happen. You can't force culture. Culture is just a natural thing that occurs, but you can definitely put the foundations in place. And to me, the foundations are you need to understand the environment that you're going into or are in, and you need to understand what makes that environment tick. And that's the coaches and that's the players. But I, I think you've got to understand them as people. So to me, to build that accountability in players of what they're doing you need to put the effort in to understand them as people first. And I think that builds trust and that starts to uh, expand the culture. And I think once that, I think you'll naturally find that players become more accountable. And if that isn't happening, I think you've got to go and talk to, whether it be a group or, you know, I'm not one for calling players out in groups. I, I don't think that's healthy. Uh, you, you go and have a conversation with the individual and find out what they think because it could be something that you're doing wrong as a coach or not necessarily doing wrong but doing something that doesn't suit them as an individual. So get their feedback. What more can I do for you, etc. So I think accountability happens quite a way along the line. Um, mm -hmm. But I know, I know with previous experience, uh, I can't really talk. Well, I've, I've given you sort of the the blueprint of my plan coming in, i.e. I need to understand the, the people and I need to understand the the environment before I look to change and adapt, etc. But definitely with previous yeah. environments, it's definitely about just talking and just understanding what those individuals need. I mean, you're, you you will get people, uh, and we, I'm sure coaches, uh, you know, there is not a purely a bad person. Nobody goes in to be you know, for once abuse of a better term, nobody goes into an environment looking to be an arse. Yeah. There's some, there's a reason for them being that or, or, or showing that behavior. And that's why you need to communicate with them. 
what do they need? I'll, I'll give you a perfect example just to round this stuff off because I'm aware that we've been going for, for quite a while. I had one player at, uh, at Fort Charles Academy and he'd never played rugby before and he came in um, and he was this proper, he thought he was it, he thought he was, you know, the best of the best. And, and to be honest with you, he wasn't a very nice kid. He turned out to be one of the best blokes I've ever worked with. And that was just through understanding what this individual needed. And I think that's a big thing that people mistake make with working with teenagers is they are going through a time in their life where hormones are banging, whatever. They are not just a bad person for the sake of being bad. You need to talk to them, understand why they're, they're showing this behavior. And that player went on to play for Highland Rugby Club and he also went on to play county level rugby. And I know throughout all my eight years of coaching, he is the best kid I've ever coached in rugby. Because yeah, and, the, and the reason for that is because there was a communication there. And from that, an understanding was built. Yeah, I get what you're saying there. But uh, when you're going to piggyback off of that, yeah, how we're looking at developing players for the long term, right? Whether yeah. it be on the pitch or as people. Yeah. Right. I think the point that you're really bringing into there is right. You, you could have handled it poorly and you would have basically been that kid's last coach probably. Probably. When you're talking yeah. about youth development, right? You as a coach never, once your season's done, right? When the players inevitably leave, yeah. right? You never want them to, want them to have you as a last coach you Absolutely want to not. it's still a, a passion that furthers them yeah. to even if they're old and beaten down or they just necessarily didn't like that practice environment that they still want to give it a go one more time somewhere else Absolutely. because if you if you train the love of the game out of somebody then you're not a good coach yeah. and you're really not confident in communication factors in anything right absolutely i, I, and, I totally agree with you and what do you what what would you deem a competent coach when looking at or evaluating their coaching practices can they adapt and can they connect to the group that they're coaching with and i think that's the biggest thing is it's a connection and an adaption. Obviously, anybody, if you give anyone a session plan, they can go and deliver that to a group. But we're not talking about that. Can they deliver it in the right way to that group? Now, so I think a competent coach is someone that can connect, can communicate, and can adapt. Yeah, and uh, I believe that's a, that's a good model in which we should structure uh, education, training, and evaluation of performance. Because when you're looking at like those qualities in which you discussed, if one of those aren't optimal, right, it sets a trigger that's negative. And if you're too traditionalistic to adapt different uh, coaching practices or models, you're probably not going to be as successful, even if you are great at communicating, right? Absolutely. And from the education point, if you don't want to do those same things either, if you want to depend on your level one certification, that's like the foundation of everything and how it should be done, right? And then you're going to be a pretty bad coach down the line because everything's always developing and evolving because that's what we're hardwired to do. That is what nature is. Absolutely. We have to, to evolve to some standpoint. And the ones that don't evolve, right, it doesn't mean they're not necessarily the most adaptable, right? It's the ones that are least likely to make the change. So, and that's really a mindset and that comes into, and when everyone wants to talk about growth versus fix, really is are you giving in to your amygdala? Exactly. Is the fear driving you so much that you're too scared to go out of this little narrow comfort zone of yours? And then if you let that permeate over time, you will 
break. You will die, you will fold. It doesn't matter anything else that's around you because you can put in some stuff to plug up the holes every once in a while, but eventually the system's going to break. No, absolutely, DJ. I, I totally agree with that. And I think that's brought us to, I don't know if we've answered uh, more questions or, or given more questions from the answers we've given over the past sort of hour, hour, hour and 20 minutes. But I think definitely, DJ, I, I personally, I mean, showing this slide right now, I, I would love to have you back on in a couple of weeks when James is back as well, because I think we've discussed, and, and this is another thing, it's an ongoing thing is this discussion with coaching practice. And I think a lot of what you said resonates with what Grant was saying last week is that, you know, it's about that, that humanistic stuff. It's about that connection. It's about that understanding of people, et cetera. And that's, as you said there, it's that evolution. Are people willing to evolve? Are people willing to continue learning? And I think, again, that's, that's what sort of, the coaches that are still in rugby after 10, 20, 30 years are those that have been willing to evolve and learn and move with time. Um, yeah. And I think definitely, DJ, as I say, um, we've had a great conversation today about, obviously, through talking about USA rugby, I think we've potentially come up together with a new uh, format for a new Five Nations, etc., which uh, we'll see. We'll see how that goes. Yeah. <laughs> we've, we've had we'll definitely take the credit for that one. Oh, definitely, mate. If it happens, yeah, it, 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 you heard it here. You hear you heard it here first, people. Um, obviously, had yeah. a great, great, obviously insight into your background and your journey and your your thoughts around practice. So this is this is definitely a, a to be continued episode um, where I'd love to get James back in and. And obviously, I think definitely with, with three or four people, if we get other coaches as well, I think it's, it's a stronger and a deeper discussion. Um, but I hope over the last hour and a half, I, I know I've enjoyed it. I know every time that we talk, I, I, I definitely learn something new. And, and um, obviously, hopefully you guys are listening in. Um, as I said, the, 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 the slide that's on the screen right now is something that I think when James comes back, uh, and we have DJ back. This is these are points that I think we'll definitely discuss. Um, and and again, guys, uh, if if any of you wants to be involved in this pod, again, we're very much an open book to to again other other sports outside of rugby. Again, this is about coaching. This is about growth. It's about development. Um, as DJ alluded to, you know, I think the best coaches are those that have been involved in numerous sports. Um, so the opportunity to come on and chat to me and James, um, if you're from different sport, I think, you know, we, we, we'd get a ton of knowledge from that. Um, so yes, guys, please, please get in touch again, DJ. It's, it's been a pleasure and, uh, yeah, we'll see you in a couple of weeks. Yeah, absolutely. And then I just wanted to give a quote just to absolutely, finish next. this one for you guys. And it's just something that I like to operate off of. Um, this is from Marcus Aurelius. All right. And everything we hear is an opinion, not a fact. Everything we see is a perspective, not the truth. So let that always drive uh, your process of coaching or thinking. Everything's a perspective and it's best utilized in the context in which you're within. What a great quote to finish with. So go away, guys. Uh, think on that. Well, on that. I know I will be. Um, and yes, we will see you. James will be back next week. So we'll see you next week. And DJ, hopefully we'll see you in a couple of weeks to continue Absolutely, this mate. discussion. Absolutely, mate. Thank you very much. Um, and enjoy the rest of your week. All right, you too, brother. Have a good one. No problem.